Hello, I'm Garrett Pryor, Senior Planner with the Town of Ashland. I'm here to explain R4 and R5 zoning. As you can see on the map, R4 and R5 zoning are located in historic Berkeley Town along Berkeley Street at a few locations in the top left. Comprise much of the 1980s um, multifamily development east of Route 1 in the top right, such as Ashland Town Square or Omni Place an infill development south of downtown along Arlington Street as you can see there in the bottom left. Our, an example of R4 zoning is the infill development known as town, or townhomes along Myrtle Street. An example of R5 zoning are these two multifamily developments along Arlington Street here, Misty Pines and Arlington Square. So how will this impact me? Great question. Our hope is through the proposed zoning changes that we can increase community safety, quality of place, and sense of community, which overall leads to the financial and social health and capital building in our community, basically to where we can improve our quality of life and our property values. We also need to know that this applies to only new development. So if there's anything in here that goes against or would require additional requirements than what's today, it's not retroactive, that it would only come into play if new development is done in the future. So what are the proposed changes? Well, the main emphasis behind the update to the R4 and R5 zoning is to really move us away from separated development or buffer development from these more intense quote-unquote zoning districts to a more integrated approach where multifamily or townhomes can be developed with single family and single family attached type of development. Let's start with the form. So townhomes. As you can see here in purple are all the different regulations we have on townhomes today. Street trees and tree canopy, the amount of open space, the number of townhomes that can be connected into one row of buildings, the overall density, the amount of road frontage that you need, the amount of recreation area that you would need to have in a development if you get over 20 units, that you have to buffer your parking so it can't be seen from other adjacent residential districts, the lot size and the lot width. What's being proposed is to keep much of that but to make a few um, incremental changes here. So to look at not just requiring an overall quantity of recreation space but really quality and where it's located, to lessen the units in a row from six to four, to not have a density maximum, and to decrease, decrease side and rear setbacks to allow for units to move and have greater ability to be developed, and to have a maximum front setback. We'll explain that in a second. As you can see here from, the, from more of the aesthetic view or the visual, there's really only height requirements that we have. And a lot of the other additional amenities, whether it be front porches or windows or other type of things, are usually done through proffers. In our Why is the Zoning Being Updated video, we'll have additional information on how the proffers have changed and really limited the ability of the town to accept those requirements on new development. So what's being proposed is to take that instead of being in a proffer and bringing up into the zoning code, making it a requirement. So not having visible cinder block, having consistent materials on the front and sides, the front door, and a window is a 15% minimum. If you want to see examples of each one of these, watch our RR1 through R3 video, and that has specific examples of what these requirements would mean on buildings. For multifamily, we're looking at a lot of those same minimum requirements as you would see with townhomes. The difference being that instead of parking being buffered, the requirement is actually to buffer the development. There's additional recreation area that's required. There's a patio or balcony per unit that's required in multifamily. And the density is higher from 7 to 12 to 15 units an acre, depending on the amount of open space provided. What's being proposed is very similar to what was being proposed for townhomes where we're removing density maximums and using whether it's units per building or front setbacks to guide development, to decreasing side and rear setbacks to allow for more movement and placement and variety of buildings, 
to instead of buffering the development using that re same requirement for townhomes to buffer parking and to lessening the no amount of open space to 30 percent but requiring a more quality common recreational and centrally used space for that. Again very similar to the townhomes really we only have the maximum height of the buildings outside of the requirements that we talked about before. So what's being proposed as is being proposed with a lot of the single family to development are the requirements you see there on the screen about window minimums, quality of materials, consistency, and a front door. So let's explain some of the nuances in the townhome and multifamily update. Front setback and parking. We're proposing a 35 maximum setback and parking in the rear and then it's buffered from view of other de of, of adjacent development. This is to prevent congestion in public streets by providing a more coordinated approach to traffic management to create attractive and inclusive communities and protect our historic character in areas by making new development more compatible with old. Here's a prime example of what no maximum setback and front yard parking can do. It removes the buildings from the street and really destroys any connectivity with adjacent properties or for pedestrians to walk down the street. An example with the Myrtle Street townhomes, this could be achieved with the maximum setback where the parking is the, in the rear. It's very compatible and it doesn't break away from the pedestrian or someone walking down the sidewalk. No density maximum. So instead of having total maximum density allowed, we're looking at regulating the number of units per building, and, and that should allow easier infill development to fit onto the site. So this is done because we're looking at trying to provide adequate light, air, and safety access to create and preserve affordable housing, which at times can be limited by density maximums and to create an attractive and inclusive and a harmonious community. An example you see here on the screen is what happens when there's when a developer tries to maximize the number of units on the land. It becomes a very pocketed community and is separate from other development that's going on around. Whereas some of the infill development we see in along Myrtle Street, as you can see here with four units in a townhome row, or here between Myrtle Street west of Center Street and Cox Lane by the Hanover Arts and Activities Center where there's six units per multifamily building, create, creates a much more pedestrian level and human experience. Quality recreation and open space. So we're looking to lower the total number or quantity of recreation and open space and really look at the requirements for quality. That's to create better access to these recreational amenities to provide better quality open space that maybe protects um, key environmental features and create that compatible community that we're all working for. Here's an example of multifamily development that provides open space but you can see it's not in a prime location and it's just put it towards the rear of the property. Whereas the multifamily development between Cox Lane and Myrtle Street has centrally located open space that's easily accessible to residents and pleasing uh, to the pedestrians walking down the street. Finally, the last change is to add cottage court as a use. These are single family homes that front on a common green space. Here's an example of what this would look like overhead. It's actually been approved as a part of the plan with Laura Dell, the de development formerly known as Green Acres. Here's the best picture view of what this development could be. They're developed as single family homes, large porches, very pleasing and opening welcome open space. Currently doesn't exist in the zoning code now because we have to, we're requiring buildings to front on streets. Although we don't have the zoning code today, we do have a similar example of what this has developed. Just south of England Street near the post office in Ashland Town Center is Blair Manor. So wonderful community, but as you can see here from the picture, instead of fronting on a green space, the requirements make it that the parking is all located in the center. 
So our hope with the, the cottage green is that instead of the large asphalt parking area, you're seeing here this common green space that is shared by the community. Uses. As you can see here on the screen, all these uses are being added to R4 and R5 zoning districts. We're hoping, like we talked about at the beginning, to make this a more inclusive and integrated zoning district. In addition to the more residential uses, you have what you see here on the screen, either allowed by right or with a conditional use permit or CUP, which would have to go through Planning Commission and Town Council to be approved. All of these are permitted in R4 and R5. I hope we can hear from you. You see the website on the screen and my contact information. This is a very important process and impacts almost all residents of Ashland. I thank you for your time.